released during the summer of 1978, right on the heels of the success of Saturday Night Fever and its star-making performance by John Travolta, Randall Kleiser's playful film adaptation of the hit Broadway musical Grease surprised everyone and no one by becoming one of the most popular movies of the last 30 years. The musical, a, con- a candy-colored send-up of 50s teenage culture and attitudes, seemed, at first glance, like an unlikely candidate for movie treatment. It was seen as a perfect opportunity for capitalizing on 50s nostalgia, Shanana, American Graffiti, Happy Days, as long as they could find a balance between the musical's raunchy, sex-tinged humor and the infectious song and dance numbers. What they came up with was a sly and knowing parody and celebration of the baby's teenage years. And by casting John Travolta, Grease was guaranteed to be a massive hit. As Danny Zuko, Travolta embodied everything that was cool about being a teenager. He was funny, sexy, goofy, and romantic, just how we like him. And he was matched by Olivia Newton-John's Nice Girl Goes Bad Sandy and Stocker Channing's Bad Girl Makes Nice Rizzo. Now, making its debut on Blu-ray, Grease is the Word on Back by Midnight. I had the opportunity to talk to filmmaker Randall Kleiser yesterday for a pre-recorded interview, and we talked about all things Grease, but first... We, I started by asking him where his appreciation of movies came from. What drew you to film? Well, um, I guess when I saw the opening of the Red Sea from the Ten Commandments as a 10-year-old, I decided I wanted to become a director. Before that, I wanted to be a magician or a puppeteer. But uh, when I saw that special effect, I realized you could be both by, uh, by being a director. Mm-hmm. And you went to, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, my notes, you, you went to uh, UCLA? USC. USC, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, went, I arrived at USC in 19, the fall of 1964, the same semester that George Lucas arrived, and uh, we became friends and eventually roommates, and, and I worked on his first student films, and he worked on my first ones. Well, well tell me about that. I mean, uh, you know, kind of, the, you know, the myth of, of George Lucas is always, you know, shrouded with, with Star Wars, but, you know, or THX, 1138, but no one ever hears about the, the those pre, you know, those preschool days. What, right. what was his, uh, you know, his approach to film then? Well, the first movie he made was in, uh, a, um, uh, it was in a class called 310, mm-hmm. and um, it was a 16-millimeter black-and-white uh, no sound, sync sound class, and um, you were given like a hundred feet of film, and you had to go out and make a movie. And so what he did was it was during the Vietnam War, and so he did a, a film protesting the Berlin Wall. And um, I was uh, in the film as an actor. It's called Freiheit, F R E I H E I T, which means freedom in German. And um, we filmed out in Malibu Canyon, uh, and um, we were, uh, I was like playing a German student trying to escape across the border. And what happened was um, I, I escape across, and I'm, I just as I'm about to get across, I get machine gunned to death. And then over that, you hear the um, people talking about how, um, you know, freedom is worth dying for and things like that. So this was his sort of like political statement about the war, or mm-hmm. about, about the, no, not the war, but, the, you know, the, the Berlin border. Right. In, in, uh, in contrast, uh, what, was, what was your student film? My film, uh, well, one of my early films was called Summer Days Don't Last, mm-hmm. and it was about a uh, an actor in Hollywood who was trying to uh, hang on to his past. He, he was uh, one of the stars of the Beach Party movies, and the whole 60s revolution was coming along with long hair and hippies, and he was trying to hang on to the Beach Party days, and he was having a reunion of all the people who 
were in those movies, and they all show up with long hair and, and mixed uh, race babies, and, and he, he he's kind of left in the dust. Mm-hmm. So mine was more of a, a typical Hollywood type of movie, and George right. was more. Well, and, uh, here's a question. Uh, what was the first uh, movie musical or just musical you remember uh, leaving an impression on you that you saw? Mm, well, I guess um, I guess uh, Easter Parade. I remember that one when I was a kid. Um, but you know, the the Elvis Presley movies were more when I was growing up, and the Beach Party films were were kind of like the musicals that I really uh, saw and and thought were lots of fun. And so, when I did Grease, it was very similar to those films. Mm-hmm. And uh, when when did you first become aware of? of Greece the musical before it was even being thought of as a film adaptation. Um I had not seen it. I just heard about it but when um after I did Boy in the Plastic Bubble with John Travolta mm-hmm. I was asked to um uh to uh, John asked for me to direct one of his three picture deals at Paramount. Uh the the movie that I originally met on was um Saturday Night Fever. And then Eventually, I was instead moved over to um, Greece. Hmm. You bring you bring up Boyne Plastic Bubble. I guess we we can start there. How did you get that that uh, job? Because that's a that's an interesting film in that it's it, uh, it's in between uh, it's 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 after Cotter, but before I think even Carrie. And also, for, as a little anecdotal footnote, it's written by a uh, film critic, Joe, Joe Morgenstern. Uh-huh. So. How did, how did that project Yeah, yeah the original story was written by Joe Morgan, so my story play was written by Douglas Day Stewart. Let's see, that was, um, I had been directing episodic television for uh, Spelling, Aaron Spelling. Um, I did The Rookies and um, Starsky and Hutch. And so um, they wanted someone to do a TV movie um, called Blood and Plastic Bubble, and I had done a master's thesis film at USC that was very, um, uh, it was about... Um, it was about a family crisis, and it was very sensitive uh, stuff about uh, relationships. And so they saw that movie, and they thought that I'd be right for Boy in the Plastic Bubble, and they offered it to me. So that, that's how it came about. I think I might have done one or two other uh, TV movies before that. Um, Dawn, Portrait of a Teenage Runaway, and yeah. So I think that's it was a combination of all those things that that. That led to that. Obviously, TV movies are a little they're a little more expansive now. But what was uh, the shooting schedule on that, and what was that that film experience like? Of Plastic well, Bubble. When the Plastic Bubble was shot, I think in either 14 or 16 days. I'm not sure. Uh, we had a shoot on Saturdays because John was shooting Cotter, and um, so he was working like six day weeks, and. Uh, it was it was great. I mean, it was a wonderful experience because I did a lot of research on the on the boy uh, named whose name was David. He was from Texas. He did die, but it was the immune deficiency, and we got all the same kind of um, technical uh, uh, apparatus that he had used to, to keep the the uh, germs away from him. These special rooms that have air blowing out, so no germs can get in, and uh, you know. Douglas Day Stewart worked on the screenplay and uh, sort of brought the teen angst into the story. The real David never made it to teen. He died at 12, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, the idea of someone going into adolescence and having to live alone in a bubble was, was a very dramatic and compelling story. And so it, it fell together very well, and we, uh, you know, we, we found Clintus. O'Connor to play the girl, and she was fantastic, uh, very likable, and uh, had a great chemistry with John. So I think that uh, that experience was probably the best TV movie experience. Well, I did do another one called The Gathering, which is pretty good, but, yeah. but this one was a lot of fun to work on. And so, and then, I, like, I guess as you said earlier, that uh, because of that experience, uh, Travolta recommended you for, mm-hmm. for, for, for Greece, and so... I'm assuming that Greece is offered to you, and you read the script, read that 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 draft of the script. What was that draft of the script like, and was it what 
what was on the, the film, or did it have to go through more rewrites? Well, basically, we uh, there was no script, as I recall, when I first was approached about Greece. They flew me to Chicago to see a road company of it and to watch the play. And then um, we talked about how we could bring it to the screen. And uh, Alan Carr and Bronte Woodard wrote a screenplay, and they added a lot of jokes and stuff. And, and then what happened during rehearsal, um, I'd sit with the actors and we would uh, read the, the original Grease play and the, and the new screenplay, and then we would sort of take things from both and, and put them together into the final shooting script. And that all happened for, during a period of five weeks before shooting. So uh, we, we retained a lot of the original script and some of the new stuff, and uh, that's how the script came about. So the play, uh, the, the musical Grease, the, the, the stage version, was very, very... Uh, suggestive and, and quite raunchy at times. Yes. And so I gotta assume there was a was was there at first an an urge to clean it up or to keep it or to try to find a balancing act. Uh, we we really found the balance because um, there there still is a lot of raunchy stuff in Greece. A lot of the do the lyrics and Greece lightning are pretty raunchy and. Um, we have the stuff about the condom that the guy opens, and we have, uh, um, you know, uh, a lot of borderline stuff, masturbation and things. But um, things like, uh, I think the play was around here, and we did clean it up a bit just for the movie. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk. Let's talk casting. Obviously, Travolta was going to be the the, the lead. Uh, have, have the lead part of Danny Zuko. So, was it then just uh, who was cast around that? And uh, well, we we had uh, we did um, open calls uh, and but but we used a lot of the people who had played Greece on Broadway, and uh, so you know nobody was set except for Travolta. But we we did interview lots of people who had done the Broadway show, and I think we ended up with quite a few of them. Uh, I think uh, Barry Pearl was on, mm -hmm. on the Broadway show. I know that uh, Jeff Conaway played Danny Zuko in, on Broadway, and John had played Duty on Broadway. So we used a lot of people who had already done it. Right. And then what was the uh, impetus of hiring kind of these, uh, the, the veterans, uh, you know, kind of these 50s icons? Oh, yeah. Well, that was that was Alan Carr and, and myself. We, we had both grown up watching all these icons on TV as kids. And um, so, you know, Eve Arden was in a show called Our Miss Brooks, and Sid Caesar was on Our Show of Shows, and Dodie Goodman was on The Gary Moore Show. And uh, I'm trying to think of who else was in that group. Just we, we wanted to cast the whole Eddie Burns was in 77 Sunset Strip. These were people that were sort of 50s icons to us, and uh, we wanted to put them in the uh, in the movie as the teachers. Mm -hmm. And uh, was was Grease filmed immediate af immediately after the wrapping on Saturday Night Fever, or yeah. was there overlap? There, no, it was right afterwards. I think uh, yeah, we 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 uh, the night of our cast and crew party for Greece, they ran the completed the first completed uh, copy of Saturday Night Fever. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things we did the, the night of our opening, our, our, our closing of the of the shoot. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so how long was the what was the filming schedule like? How long was it? I think it was about fifty days, a little over fifty days. Mm -hmm. And um. Uh, we we rehearsed for five weeks ahead of time. Uh, half of it was, you know, in the mornings we would do the um, the dialogue stuff, and in the afternoons the dance stuff. And and in in the middle of the day we would work on the the um, we work on the transitions between them. Important. The transitions are extremely important because if you don't get them right, it doesn't work at all. Right. Kind of musical when people are talking and suddenly start singing, it, it's got to really come out of it. It can't just be suddenly <clears throat> starts and the song starts. Yeah, and, and you know, Greece, uh, you know, you know, obviously it has a, a huge fan base, but you know, I'm, I don't think critics give it enough enough credit for. There's never there are no awkward moments between song and non singing mm -hmm. sequences. Well, we worked very hard on that during the rehearsal period, and Pat Birch, who was the choreographer, 
had choreographed the Broadway show, and so she was really aware of how that all worked. And also the actors, half of the actors were from the Broadway show, so they knew how the audience, the live audience reacted. So, you know, I had that advantage that those people knew, you know, a lot more than I did about how to make that work. And was it always from the get-go you wanted to shoot it in widescreen the way you did? Yeah, yeah. I think, we, you know, for a musical it's always nice to see, especially when you have a lot of dancers, to see them all, you know, lined up and, and dance, especially like the dance contest and the end scene where they're dancing on down the, down the football field. That, that would not look as good in uh, regular 185. Yeah, one of the, the true advantages, I, I think people are going to be kind of startled with this Blu-ray and, I'm sure with the last couple of DVD releases, but particularly this Blu-ray, uh, you know, there's a whole maybe generation, maybe two generations, who just grew up with this film, pan and scan. Oh yeah, yeah, that's I don't like that at all. Yeah. And uh, I, I I remember the yeah, first time I, yeah, I remember the first time I saw it in the theater. When, I think it was on the 20th anniversary re-release, and I was kind of, it, it it literally was like seeing a new film. It's kind of yeah. startling. Well, so you said it was like a fifty some odd day shoot, and so tell me about some of that scheduling. Was were you know non singing days followed by a dance sequence, or was it usually a, the, usually the dance sequences where you have a whole day to shoot them? Um, we we would like Grease Lightning was a whole day, and and uh, uh, Beauty School Dropout. Each each musical number was a day. Mm -hmm. uh, I think for the end sequence we had two days. Um, I recall, maybe more, but um, uh, usually we'd have the dialogue scenes would be one day, and then the musical scenes would be another day. And are they singing on set, or are they lip-syncing to pre-recorded? They were all recorded ahead of time, and it's playback, so they would just, um, they would uh, mouth the words, and they would be playing. And I learned how to do all this because I was an extra in um, a lot of musicals when I was in college. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, was actually in a few Elvis Presley movies. <laughs> really? Which, which one? Um, well, let's see. There was uh, Easy Come, Easy Go, and Double Trouble, and um, hmm, let's see, Double Trouble. I, I, two others. But uh, did you ever? Were you in a? Were you an extra in a scene with uh, with Elvis? Yeah, yeah, in Double Trouble. I, <laughs> was dancing with a girl in the early part of the movie and, and Elvis comes down and pulls her uh, up on stage and dances with her and then she comes back down to me. So I had like a little, a little bit with Elvis. I guess I'm gathering you didn't have much, you, you had no interaction, but what was it like seeing Elvis? Well, he was very friendly because I had done like, um, uh, I had done these four films and he recognized me from those those other ones. He was real friendly, he said hello, and didn't know my name, but he just said hello. And he had these bodyguards around him, and they'd all do karate during lunch. And uh, he was, it was the period where he was fit, you know, it wasn't mm -hmm. during his heavy deals, heavy days. But, um, yeah, it was, he, he was a very friendly guy. Some people might know this story, some people don't. I guess uh, the, the, the folklore of Greece is the, uh, the day you shoot the uh, Sandra D number is the day Elvis died. That's right, yeah, yeah. And uh, it was very eerie because we had a scene where um, Stocker Chang jumps up on the bed and, and is right next to a picture of Elvis, and that was the day he died. And it just felt very strange doing that. Mm -hmm. I'll, ask, I'll ask you, what was the easiest musical number to shoot, and which one was the, the hardest? Well, I guess the easiest to shoot was uh, probably... Be, uh, uh, no, um, Look at me, I'm Sandra D. It was just, uh, it was just uh, the girls moving around that room, and mm -hmm. Pat just choreographed them. And the most difficult probably was, well, it wasn't that hard to shoot the end scene. Uh, or probably it was, uh, yeah, you're the one that I want was probably the hardest because we only had half a day to shoot that, and um, we didn't. In the morning of the day, we didn't know exactly where we were going to shoot it. We were looking around trying to figure out what to do with that song. And um, we saw the uh, fun house, and we thought, we went, Pat and I walked in there and said, well, what if they would just go to the fun house and come out the other side? And so we quickly, she quickly staged that, and we went in and shot it. And we went so quickly that we didn't get all the coverage that we needed, so we had to go back later and 
at the Paramount Studios we built, mm -hmm. um, the, the, we rebuilt that set uh, to make it so that we could do close-ups of the two of them singing because it didn't play all in one shot. Well, I'll ask you about three particular numbers. Uh, one, uh, the uh, at the drive-in, yeah. the uh, Travolta's solo, and I'm curious, was that kind of a logistical uh, kind of a headache in that you have to, because uh, you're dealing with uh, background images on, on the on the screen with the, the hot dog and so forth, and you want to get that just right on, on certain lines. Was, was that tricky, or was that kind of a, did that all fall into place? Well, that did fall into place, but it was it was by luck because when we showed up that night to shoot, I had 30 uh, trailers, you know, popcorn trailers from the 50s that I had sent away from uh, for from Chicago, and I hadn't seen any of them. And um, so we knew we wanted them to sit on the on the uh, swing, but we didn't know which one we were going to put behind them. So. I, I just ran all 30 of them at the drive-in while the crew sat around, and, and I saw the one with the hot dog and said, can we sync the end of the song to that? And uh, the projection guys and the sound guys said, yeah, we can do that. So that, it all came about that night. With uh, It was sort of an improv, and uh, it worked really well. Mm -hmm. So that was just very good luck. The the first real big one, the uh, the uh, Summer Nights. Uh, yes. That one's in, uh, I'm curious about that one because you're cutting back. I mean, basically, it's two different. It's two groups singing, uh -huh. and so you have to. Uh, in, I guess that one was done in the editing room. The time yeah, we shot them separately and then in the editing, cut them together, and that was uh, pretty much the way it was on stage. You know, on the stage, the girls were on the right side of the stage, and the boys were on the left. And um, so it was very clear when I saw that in Chicago um, how to shoot that. You know, just cut back and forth, and then at the end, the split screen idea was. Um, uh, was kind of fun to, to do because that was in the in the play they're just standing next to each other but we've got that idea of using the um, the crane with Travolta pulling back and, and I think that worked pretty well. And then I guess finally the, the dance contest because that's a good uh, fifteen almost twenty minutes of the film. Yeah, yeah, that was all done basically by Pat Birch um, in the rehearsal. You know, she. She came up with all the choreography, and then I, I worked out the um, the staging of the actors, you know, the, the story points that were happening during that. But but basically, you know, she came up with this amazing choreography, and, and we rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed. And so when we got there, it was pretty easy to shoot because everybody knew what they were going to do. And uh, I guess the additional, I mean, uh, a couple of songs were, were added just for the movie, if I'm not correct. That's true, yeah. Uh, we, we found that certain songs in the play weren't really that exciting, and, and, and we thought we could do better, and we hired these uh, Olivia Newton-John's um, songwriter to write You're the One That I Want and uh, Helplessly Devoted to You to replace songs that were in the play that we didn't think were up to speed. And, uh, well, and when, you, when you do those, those two songs in particular... Now, so obviously you, you, you're replacing songs with two different songs, but also did you also have to create uh, the scenes to to get those songs in there? Particularly, I guess, hopelessly devoted to you. Did you know that that was going to follow uh, Sandra D? No, we we had to find a place for that song. It was written by John Farrar and brought to us, and we listened to it, and then we tried to figure out where we could stick it in the script. And it was while we were shooting that we had to figure that out because um, it wasn't written before we started, and there was nowhere in the script that was indicated for that. So we had looked at a rough cut and said, well, maybe it'll fit here. So we had them build the um, backyard set and uh, shot that, I think, the last day or so of the shoot because uh, up until then we didn't know what where, where we were going to put it. And uh, But uh, you're the one that I wanted that, uh, even if you didn't know, that seemed to kind of be a given that it was going to... Yes, we were going to have a duet between John and Olivia. We didn't know... Uh, we knew it would be at the end of the movie, but we didn't know what it would be. And so um, uh, John Farrar came up with that song, and then Pat came up with the basic choreography. But like mm -hmm. I said, they, they, we didn't know where we were gonna put, how we were going to stage it until that day. Mm -hmm. So y y you rap, and uh, how long was post-production? 
Um, the post-production was uh, probably six months, I, I seem to recall. I mean, we shot in 77. It came out in, in 78. Mm -hmm. So I guess we were... I don't remember too well about that. I think it must have been about six months. And when you first saw a rough assembly, you know, assembly of it, did you know you had something, or were no, no, we still didn't know. Uh, we we didn't know till we went to Hawaii to, for the preview, and um, the, all the heads of Paramount flew over there, and we had a, a, a preview. And um, at the preview, when John started coming down the bleachers singing um, "Summer Nights," and he was dancing down the bleachers, the whole audience started laughing. And we thought that they were laughing at it. And we thought, oh my God, we've got a, this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> but they were laughing because they liked it. And we figured that out. And then the, the, all the, the cards came in, the preview cards, and they all loved the movie. So then we knew, you know, that we had a chance. And now, I'm assuming when, when you're previewing it, obviously, Saturday Night Fever had hit. Uh, um, I don't remember if it had or not. I don't think so. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't think it had come out yet. I'm not sure. I don't know when that came out. Was the um, opening credit slash uh, title song, was that uh, also something that came in the last minute, or was that something early on? Well, we had we had written, uh, there's a guy named Bradford Craig who had written a script, uh, a song called Grease that was uh, much more 50s sounding, and uh, we were originally going to use that. It had lots of references to the uh, to the 1950s. And the whole title sequence was animated to that song. And then um, Robert Stigwood, uh, because of, the, of the, the tremendous success of the Bee Gees uh, in Saturday Night Fever, he asked Barry Gibb to write a new song called Grease, and Barry wrote it. And then, um, so we took out the one that was <laughs> the thing was animated to and, and just stuck on Barry Gibb's song, and um, it worked fine. <laughs> you know, nobody realizes that it was not animated to that. It was animated to something else. Mm -hmm. And uh, the film comes out in the summer of uh, of '78, yes. and uh, Saturday, Night, Saturday Night Fever has has already come out. So yes. Travolta is riding this this wave. What what was that uh, that opening weekend? What do you remember that opening weekend? Well, um, we had a, pre a premiere at uh, Grandma's Chinese Theater, and uh, we had a lot, everyone was pulling up in limousines. It was a very big Hollywood opening, and uh, there's the thousands of screaming people outside. It was very, very much like you would imagine a um, Hollywood premiere. And um, John and Olivia were, you know, mobbed, but not anything like they were when we went to London for that premiere, because by then. Saturday Night Fever had been out for quite a while, and John was huge, bigger probably than ever. And um, there's a riot in in, this, in the Leicester Square where they had the premiere, and um, they were they had like hundreds of police there trying to protect us as we went to the theater, and and John was almost ripped apart, and he was terrified when when we got, when he got through the crowd and he was inside the theater, he was shaking and and almost in tears because it was so scary because everyone was trying to just grab at him, you know. Mm -hmm. And so what is that, uh, when you had that big hit I mean, of a film, financial success, I mean, uh, that must have been kind of a, was that startling for you, that the film? <laughs> that the film? Well, it was very pleasant. Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't complain. I'd, I had no idea it was going to be a hit. And uh, when it was, it was... You can't you can't complain about that. It was it was great. Um, I really wanted to make the Blue Lagoon, and um, so I had started trying to get that off the ground. And I, even though Greece was a hit, I still couldn't get the financing for Blue Lagoon. And I had a, it took me quite a while before Frank Price at Columbia Pictures finally said yes to that. And because of that, was that because of the subject matter? Yeah, people thought nobody wants to look at two people for two hours, just two people with nobody else in the movie. Mm -hmm. I didn't think it would hold. And of course you were vindicated with that one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, this is 1978. This is obviously pre-mass uh, production of, of home video. Mm -hmm. and so people, you know, they, they have, you know, you know, movies are, are hits, but, you know, up until a certain 
point, up until uh, you know, up until about eighty three, eighty four, uh, usually your your film went into you know, if your film was going to get ever seen again, it was going to be on you know late night movie at two in the morning. Yeah. You know that was going to be going to be it, or an occasional. If your film was a big success, you know that occasional re-release. Yeah. Uh-huh. But so when were you? When did when did you become aware that Greece was one of these? You know, video staples that. Well, I think video cassettes came about around that time. You know, mm-hmm. I think it was right around the late seventies, early eighties that the mm-hmm. VCR started happening, and so Greece was one of the first ones that was available on VHS, mm-hmm. and so it, it was one of the top sellers at the beginning. Mm-hmm. So I think it, it hit at the right moment there. And uh, looking at it, looking back at it now, I mean, here it is, thirty, you know, plus years. It's now coming out on Blu-ray, which I mean, it looks better than ever. It looks probably looks as good as it did when it premiered, and the sound is spectacular. Right. And uh, so, what, what do you think about it when you look at it uh, now? Um, well, I think it's more fun to look at it with an audience than on Blu-ray. Um, uh, you know, I think it's we've gone to quite a few of these sing-alongs, and um, the audience really knows all the lyrics and they sing along with it, and, and it's a lot of fun. I think. It might be on the Blu-ray. I'm not sure if they have it. They might have a um, sing-along version where you, and the lyrics are there. But people seem to like these songs so much that they want to sing with them, and, and that's kind of fun. But it's best to do it with a group rather than at home, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what do you think it is the appeal of Grease 30 Years On? Because, I mean, it's really kind of, I mean, it has the sexual innuendo and, and all that kind of sly stuff that undercuts the 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 upbeat uh, surface, but I mean, you know, if you know your 50s history, uh, you know, it's kind of the, the, the flip side of Rebel Without a Cause or, or the Wild One. But, well, what do you think is the appeal of Greece? Well, the music is certainly uh, one factor. I mean, there's so many good songs in it. Uh, it's upbeat. I mean, I think everybody feels good after they look at it. And, um, I think that also uh, there's a lot of archetypes in it that you can find in any high school. It's all about peer pressure and peer relating and dreams and trying to get ahead, uh, you know, with your life. And uh, it just sort of hits everything. I think the characters are pretty well delineated. You kind of understand them all and like them. So, um, but I don't know what the real answer is about why it's so... um, uh, popular, you know, it's it, it's just came together in an interesting way, I guess. Well, before I let you go, I gotta ask you about one of my favorite films uh, that you've done. Um, I guess you know, one of those films. I know people who, if they ever do see it, they always come back to me and say, "Wow, how come I never heard about that film?" And I gotta I gotta ask about um, it's my party, mm-hmm. uh, which. I remember I saw it, it came to my local theater, uh, I think for a week, uh-huh. and I made a point of uh, of going with my parents, mm-hmm. uh, because I, I'd seen the uh, rave review of Siskel and Ebert, mm-hmm. and uh, I was a big, I'm a big Eric Roberts fan, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, any kind of anecdote related to that, like, I, if anyone who uh, who hasn't seen It's My Party, uh, they, sh- they should rent it. it, it contains an amazing central performed by Eric Roberts? Well, it was during a period in, in our history when um, if someone got AIDS, it was a death sentence. And so um, anybody who, who contracted the disease, they knew they were going to die. And it was just how they were going to die. Was it going to be a slow, agonizing death or, or not? And this particular character that's based on a real person, a real friend, um, knew of a particular brain disease called uh, leukoencephal, uh, I forget the name, PML. Um, it's a very complicated name, but it, basically it's a brain disease that, that hits the brain very quickly and moves very, very quickly and turns the, the victim into a vegetable within days. And so he didn't want to become a vegetable, and so he decided to have a party, say go out to his friends, and then at the end of the party, take his own life. And this is what happened, and so we made a movie about it. And um, on the DVD, there's like um, 
images from the party it was based on. It was all written about real people, and I interviewed each person who was at the party and wrote, wrote their characters. So it was a really um, uh, personal and, and very emotional journey to make that film, and um, I turned down some big, big Hollywood films to make it. It was, it was a very low-budget picture, but all my friends, all my actor friends, came and um, worked for uh, scale, and uh, it was a labor of love on everybody's part, and I'm really glad that we were able to make it. Um, it didn't make a lot of money, but it's out there, and people can see it, and um, it sort of captures a period in, in history before there was any hope. Now, right. there's all kinds of drugs that, that stave off the, uh, uh, the, the disease, but then it was not, and so this captures like a period in our um, in history where, where it was a little window where, where it was desperate. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'll just ask you this. Uh, you know, the casting of, you know, getting someone like Eric Robertson in that lead role to play that role, you know, you know now, I, you know, people, you know, they don't, you know, back in 95, 96 when this film was around, um, it was still kind of a, a career crapshoot to play a openly gay character and have scenes of intimacy mm -hmm. uh, with another person. Right. Well, I think Eric was going through a period where he had done a lot of films playing the same kind of 